Jamila Moore is the Education Director of Grow Portland. She is originally from the Big Island of Hawaii, where she learned to love plants. She has over 13 years of experience teaching in gardens, farms, and classrooms, and she is passionate about cultivating community and professionalizing garden education. Please welcome Jamila to the stage. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, it's truly an honor to be here with you wrapping up this amazing weekend. Um, just give a quick shout out if you have learned something new this weekend. All right. Um, yeah, my name is Jamila Moore. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the education director of Grow Portland. We are a small nonprofit that does school day garden education. Um, we're currently partnered with 10 elementary schools, so we work with about 4,000 students, and our programming is mainly focused on environmental science, social emotional learning, um, and a deep connection to nature. Um, we are located in Portland, Oregon, on the unceded traditional lands of the Chinook and many other tribes. Um, and these are just a couple photos of our kiddos in the gardens um, from some of the schools that I used to teach at. All right, so to get started, I just want to acknowledge that the subtitle of my talk, um, The Silver Linings of a Pandemic, might feel a little bit complicated just knowing um, what we've all been through on a spectrum. I know many different experiences over the last two years, but just knowing that there has been so much tragedy um, and heartache in this time. And so I want to be really intentional in talking about the silver linings for us at Grow Portland um, is really just the gift of time. So being able to slow down, be reflective, um, and to try and consider the ways that we might decolonize some aspects of our work. Um, it's ironic that I chose a lightning talk to talk about slowing down. I've never done a lightning talk before either. <laughs> I'm used to having like 90 minutes and being able to unpack this stuff. But um, I'm going to do my best to just give you a, a tiny snapshot of some of the um, initiatives that we're currently working on. Um, so as a white-led organization that mostly works with communities of color, it feels super important for us um, to continue to identify the ways that we operate within and perpetuate um, elements of white supremacy culture. So I know that might be a familiar idea for many of you, stemming from the work of Tima Okun over the last 25 years, continuing to do that work. Um, but I feel like if you're new to this idea, um, and for us, it's really important to just remember that white supremacy culture um, is not just violent extremists, right? It is the water that we all swim in. Um, it's the oppressive and racist systems and structures um, that uphold white domination and are often invisible, and we don't even notice them. Um, so for us at Grow Portland, there were three elements of white supremacy culture that um, continue to feel very prevalent in what we do. So um, that emphasis on urgency and efficiency and always being as productive as possible um, and getting things done um, as quickly as possible at any cost. And then that obsession with perfectionism, needing to get it right um, rather than celebrating mistakes. Um, these ways of being are super depleting and it's impossible. Like we just can't keep operating in these ways. Um, so for us, these last couple years have been an opportunity for us to try and move towards more relationships, caring about people, um, professional development and learning, learning from our mistakes, um, and a lot of vulnerability and self-awareness. It also feels important for me personally to mention that I became a mama on April 1st, 2020. Um, <laughs> uh, this is little Arlo up here. He's with his papa out at a playground right now. Um, becoming a parent uh, at the height of a global pandemic and amidst uh, racial and social uprisings um, was not a joke. That was, that was intense. Um, but it also helped to reinforce this silver linings and opportunity to slow down, um, to take better care of ourselves and each other, um, and at work to really try and do a better job of reflecting and celebrating these communities that we work with. So, uh, when schools shut down in 2020, um, we pivoted to virtual learning, as I know many of you did, and, and that's another talk on everything that we learned in that. That was definitely a learning journey that I hope we never have to do again. 
Um, we also turned our 10 gardens into production sites, and we were able to grow over 4,000 pounds of food that were given to um, school cafeterias and food pantries. Um, so while I was on maternity leave, these people were doing this amazing work. They were, um, I'm just so incredibly proud of our team for doing that work. Um, when we had more time on our hands, we also increased the frequency of our staff meetings um, and really tried to focus more on our, our staff's mental health and well-being. So encouraging more self-care, um, paid time off, uh, more personal check-ins, just making sure, like, how are we all doing in this time? We're all experiencing this in really different ways. Uh, we also, because we weren't teaching like we normally would, we had more time to do some community partnerships. So we reached out to some local BIPOC-led farms, um, and we did some paid team building visits out to those farms, and also um, filmed interviews with those farmers that then we incorporated back into our virtual learning with students so they could see farmers that looked and sounded like them. Um, we also did a 21-day racial equity challenge, so in the winter of 2020. Uh, we just did a month of a deep dive into a lot of anti-racist materials um, and a lot of critical conversations around what do we do now in this moment. Um, and so the racial equity challenge informed what we're currently doing now on an ongoing basis which is that every month we have um, selected resources and materials that all of our staff, from our interns to our executive director, um, we engage with. So some of them are documentaries or TED Talks or articles, sometimes books um, or lots of podcasts. And those are directly connected to our monthly curriculum themes. And so looking at ways that we might be able to um, incorporate elements of equity, inclusion, and justice back into our programming on the ground. So for example, in January, when we're teaching students about birds um, and their roles in garden ecosystems, we were learning from uh, Dr. J. Drew Lanham, who is a wildlife biologist. Does anyone know him? Great. Uh, he, uh, he's a professor at Clemson University. Um, we listened to uh, a great On Being podcast with him and read a couple articles and really, you know, learned about how the field of birding has been such an elitist and white dominated field, um, often very unsafe for folks of color. Um, and so thinking about ways that we might in small ways, try and make this a more inclusive and safe um, occupation for folks of color. Um, he also talks a lot about needing to know what you love before you know what to fight for. So really emphasizing that connection between joy and justice, which I think especially working with kids feels really important. Um, in February, when we were teaching kids about food systems, we were highlighting the work of Leah Penniman. Clap twice if you know Leah Penniman. Awesome. Um, so <laughs> Leah Penniman, you might know her from Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York. And she also wrote the book Farming While Black. So she is an educator, farmer, uh, food justice activist, uh, super inspiring person. She's got so many talks that are so wonderful. Um, and then we were also learning from Alexis Nicole Nelson. Anyone know? Yay, great. Uh, AKA Black Forager, so she is just this magnetic personality on uh, TikTok and Instagram. So we, again, podcasts and articles and talks from these two amazing people. Um, and connecting back to food systems. So with Leah Penniman, um, really learning about all of the African food ways, tools, techniques, um, and traditions that are embedded in our Western food systems and yet go um, unrecognized and uncelebrated. So really trying to make those more explicit and celebrate them. And she talks a lot also about um, the power of connecting to our ancestors through food and the idea of Earth as a relative that all just feel really important. Um, and then Alexis Nicole Nelson, who is just this amazingly creative um, forager, is trying to reclaim um, that food tradition of foraging as a, a nurturing and resourceful way of eating, especially for black and indigenous communities. All right, one more example for you. Um, in March, when we were teaching kids about plant parts, their functions, um, we were also learning from Dr. Robin Wall Kimmer, who is the author of one of my very favorite books. How many have read uh, Braiding Sweetgrass? 
Yay, so many hands, great. Um, so she is an author, um, botanist, professor, and also a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation. Um, she is just a beautiful writer and speaker and thinker. And so in the process of um, talking about plants, She's really trying to weave Western scientific knowledge in with indigenous knowledge systems and values. And so we were trying to find ways that in teaching kids about plants, we might not just be learning about plants, but learning from plants and trying to center plants as co-teachers in all of this. Um, and by doing that, trying to really emphasize reciprocity and gratitude and deep respect for all living things. All right, so how does this all manifest on the ground with our students? Um, in addition to continuing to be really explicit about our identities, our privilege, our power, um, also trying to grow as much culturally specific and meaningful foods in our gardens. Um, we just have a very diverse um, school community, and so getting input from the students and families about what we grow is really important. Also, trying to source more picture books. This might seem like a small thing, but we found that it's really important to be highlighting um, books that really feature kids of color, are written by authors of color, and celebrate the communities that we're in. Um, also, translating a lot of our lesson materials, this is a new thing for us, but um, translating them into Mandarin and Spanish. And we recently hired bilingual educators that are teaching in those languages. We have a couple immersion schools, um, so that's really helpful. Um, and then continuing to do those farm field trips and then bringing those photos and videos back to our students. Um, but I think also one of the biggest things that we are working on is just shifting our programmatic learning objectives and goals. So yes, we want kids to grow and eat a lot of kale. That is important. Um, and we do hope that maybe they know the basics of pollination or photosynthesis. But I think even more important than that, we are hoping that students might understand and appreciate uh, their relationship and their responsibility to a mason bee or a maple tree or their classmate and really trying to ground that as our main learning goals. Um, so at the end of the year, we always ask kids, what did you learn in garden school with us? Um, and this quote is from a second grader. So he said, I learned that bugs need respect just like people do. Um, and so for me, that's, that's the heart of what we're trying to do. All right, so just to wrap up, a couple of these um, takeaways are that this work around critical thinking um, is not always easy. It's uncomfortable uh, to kind of uproot some of your long-held ways of doing things and thinking. It takes a lot of vulnerability. It's also slow. It's, it's not quick. Um, also, in this moment when it might feel like the world is really dark and bleak <laughs> and this work can feel hard and heavy, there is also an invitation and space for joy. And all of the resources that I mentioned, um, also there's a, a long list of lots of links on Sketch if you're interested in kind of seeing what we've done over the last year. All those materials are there. They all have this element of light and hope and possibility, and that feels really important too. Um, and all of those resources also are either free or very affordable and publicly accessible. So this does feel like something that is doable for a small organization with a limited budget like we have. Um, and then just one more reminder that slowing down, staying open, being willing to do things differently um, is hard. And I think it's maybe the most important thing we can do right now. So I know a lot of you are doing this important work as well. I really hope we can connect, and I would love to hear your ideas so that we can just keep growing this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Enjoy.